So let's begin. You know, I, I want to just present something to you this morning that I think is both, you know, it, it's, it's intriguing, it's fascinating. It's a little bit, deals with a very radical statement made about Moshe Rabbeinu in this week's parasha, which is kind of something we're going to read and it's going to be unnerving a little bit. And I'm going to take us through an explanation of the Maharami Prague. And by doing so, I think we're going to accomplish a number of goals. And goal number one, we just understand how when our sages say something that appears so strange and so radical, the depth of what the explanation is behind that. And that's something the Maharal does. And I think this particular explanation, we're going to understand a little bit about relationships in general, and especially interaction male-female, and um, get a deeper insight into what marriage is. It's, it's, it's something for me, this particular class, which is very foundational on many levels. Okay, and it's, we're going to be, it's, the starting point's going to be Parshish Korach, and, but we're going, to buy, we're going to look and we're going to understand something, I think, that's going to just touch us on, again, on many, many different areas. Okay, so that's, that's the goal we're going to try to do right now. What, let's take a look at, at, at the Parsha just for a moment. And in, in the Parsha, we know the story of Korach. So we ended, we ended yesterday's class, or the last few days of class, we, were, we explored colors together. The reds, the whites, the blues. And we, the, the, conclusion, the conclusion of that discussion really brought us right to Parsha Korach because he dressed everybody up into chelos in blue and was making a statement by that. The statement he was trying to, to say to Moshe Rabbeinu was that, you know, we we're all want to go for the goal. We all want Kedusha. We all, we're all holy. We don't need a process. And that's what blue represents, the ultimate Kisei Akavo, the blue of Kol. Techelet means all. The root of Techelet is Kaf Lamed, which means it all comes together. Everything comes together. And there's a truth in his argument. And, and as we know, a good argument is, um, has some truth. You know, a good falseness has some truth. He was saying something absolutely true. You know, the goal is to get to that blue. And well, maybe, you know, what do we need? Oh, you know, why do we need all the details if we want to strive for the holiness? So the answer to the question is, is of course, that there's a process. And the process requires what we call tahara, going from white, going from reds to whites. And that was our, our code word yesterday. So I hope that that system works, and, you know, for us all. You know, if you have any questions, you know, please ask me about it. And I, I think it, it's helpful in the red, white, blue scheme, and under really understanding the vision of Judaism through it. That, that we're trying to take the physical world and bring out that white light, bring out that white color, bring out that, that wisdom. Now, in, in, in the Parshish Korach, so in the attack against Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, it, again, it was Korach was a, a direct relative. He was a first cousin. He was an extraordinary Tabu Chafam. He was also one of the wealthiest men in Christ. Well, he really had it all. He had, he had a degree of jealousy. And he started fomenting this rebellion against Moshe. And this rebellion was very difficult for Moshe to, to, to accept because Moshe did everything the Shem Shemayim. He didn't want any kavod. He, he didn't even want the position. Remember at the early in the story when Hashem appears to him at the, tells him to go to the Mitzrayim to rescue the Jewish people. So he says, Aaron, take Aaron. Aaron's my older brother. He should do it. He's been leading the Jewish nation. I've been in Midian for all these years. Why me? You know, so, so we see his level of anibot, his level of humility, and therefore for the you know for people to accuse him of usurping power and wanting power and, and nepotism and and pointing his brother you know to the coin goggles that commanded Hashem was extraordinarily difficult for him. Now, Chazal says something else, and this is what we're going to right now. Our sages say they accused Moshe Rabbeinu of something else. Now hold on to your hold on to your to your, to your seats for this one. So I'll read you the verse. The Pasik says in the in the beginning of the Parsha, again I'm just to read the Pasik, it says that Yaakov al Moshe, he gathered against Moshe al Aaron, the Yomorlain, and he said to them, Rav you've taken too much for yourself. 
כי כל העיד הוא כולם קדוש בסוך השם. The entire nation is holy. ובסוך השם, השם is amongst all of us. All of us. מדוע הסנאצו כל כל השם? Why have you elevated yourselves above the entire Jewish people? That's their attack, right? There should be equality. There should be democracy. There shouldn't be a, a, a leadership where some people are given greater responsibility and power. And, and there's some truth to that also, by the way. You know, there's some falseness in it. We do have a system of experts, and we have to rely on experts. And there's sometimes different people do different things. And then listen to this. He says, Vayishma Mo. Moshe, Moshe listens, but ye pull up on off. He hears, and he falls on his face. So, Chalal are bothered by that. V'yishma Moshe, what do you mean he heard? Of course he heard. He heard, he just, he just spoke to him. V'yishma, what does it mean? And he, and he listened, and he heard. And he reacts to it very dramatically. The ye pull up on off, he falls down, he can't stand. So, again, there's something in Moshe's response which seems to be a little strange. They come with a, an attack. He listens. Well, of course he listens. He just was speaking to them. Why does the Torah have to say he heard? It sounds like he heard something else. And whatever he heard caused it to fall down. So listen to what I say to say. And again, this can be found in, in, in Tractate Sanhedrin, Kofiud, which is 100 page 110. V'yishma Moshe v'yipalapana And Moshe heard and he fell on his face. It says, shama. What hearing did he hear? Of course, I mean, again, the Torah doesn't waste words. He just spoke to him, and he heard. Well, of course he heard. What, what does that mean? And he heard. It says, shama. What hearing did he hear? They suspected him of Eishas Ish. As the Pasuk says, and they were jealous of Moshe in the camp. What did he hear? He heard an amazing, a shocking complaint against him. He suspected him of being involved with other people's Wives. Did you hear that? It's called Ashes Ish. Ashes Ish is one of the explicit violations of the Ten Commandments. It's um, one of the most severe crimes um, of immorality a person could commit. It says, the Chashduhu, he heard, that's what he heard. He heard something, not just what they're saying. He heard a Shemua. Shemua means like a rumor. He heard something floating in the camp that he was in violation of Aishas Ish. They accused him of infidelity with all of the women in the camp. And it says, as the Pasuk says, as the Pasuk at Tehillim, it says, V'yekanur the Moshe B'machin, the double Melech says at Tehillim, V'yekanur the Moshe B'machin, and they were jealous of Moshe in the camp. Jealousy. Jealousy. Amr Rashmul Bar Yitzchak, and the Gemara continues and says, Amr Rashmul Bar Yitzchak, says Rashmul the son of Yitzchak, the Lamed that teaches us, she called Echad the Echad Kina as Ish to Moshe. Every man was jealous of Moshe regarding his own wife. She Namar, as it says, Umoshi Yikach as Oil of a Nut living with the Machina. And what was Moshe's response to that? He took his tent. And he camped outside of the camp. He left. Moshe went out of the camp. Why? Because people were suspecting him of infidelity. Okay, everybody. What do we do with this one? Yeah? Are we with me on this? This is a, uh, a shocking accusation against Moshe Rabbeinu. And again, what's, how does it fit into the words? It fits into the words because it says, Vayishma Moshe. He just said to him, they came to him, Korach and Korach made his complaint and he said that we're all holy. Tired Jewish nations did our Sinai. You know, why have you usurped all this power for yourself? And then the Pasuk says, Vayishma Moshe. And Moshe heard. What do you mean he heard? Standing right there. Of course he heard. No, he heard something else. He heard a Shmua. Shmua in Hebrew means a rumor. 
And what did that and that and that rumor caused him to fall down physically on his face and to take his tent and to move outside of the camp, according to the Gemara. And again, what did the accuse him of? What does the Talmud say? Gemara said, Gemara said, Hedin. So our sages are, are telling us what's what this Pasuk, this verse is referring to. Again, let me read to you one more time the Gemara. It says, Vayishma Moshe, Vayishpala Apano. And Moshe fell on his, he heard and fell on his face. Mashmur Shama, what did he hear? Rashmur Bar Nachbani Am Rav Yochanan. Rashmur Bar Nachbani says the name of Rav Yochanan. Shechashdu al Eishasech. They suspected him of infidelity, immorality. Shinamar, as it says in Tehillim, be kind of the Moshe with Malchim, the Dabin Melech says this. And they were jealous of Moshe in the camp. I'm Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak, says Rav Shmuel Bar Yitzchak. Vilamni should call Echad the Echad. Every man, Kina es Ishtam emotion, was Kina, was jealous of his wife regarding Moshe. Shinamar, when Moshe Yichach is other than not love you, Chutz the as the Pasuk said, and therefore Moshe went outside the camp and camped outside the camp. Okay, everybody. Go ahead. Any questions on this? What do we do with this? What do we do with this statement of our sages? I mean, how much more shocking can it be? In fact, it's so shocking, I didn't even want to include it in the title of the, uh, when I, you know, I oftentimes put a title to the class and when I put it on the, um, the WhatsApp chat, I didn't want to put that, <laughs> that they accused Moshe of infidelity because I didn't want people to see it and, get, you know, and just be so shocked. But it's, it's a shocking statement. How could that be? How could they accuse Moshe of infidelity? It's almost beyond belief. Rabbi, we live in times when this technique used every day. So we are used to this technique, <laughs> unfortunately. Go ahead. What do you mean? Say again. I don't understand. Say. What do you, what do you mean? I mean that people accuse powerful people in infidelity. That's true. But, but number one, one would think Moshe was so above criticism. I mean, and infidelity? And not only that, it says every man accused him of infidelity. It's one thing to say, you know, find one woman somewhere or something. No. Every man accused him or was concerned, was jealous of his wife regarding emotion. How could that mean? How could we every man in the classroom? Every man? So how do we understand that? that that's really what the, the issue is. How could that be? It's, it's, it's such a wild accusation, it boggles the mind. And, you know, that... that, that what do we do? What do we do with the statement of our sages? How do we understand this? I get David the Melech refers to it in Tehillim. King David says in Tehillim, "Be kind of the Moshe b'Machina." They were jealous of Moshe in the camp. And what were they jealous of? They were jealous of the fact that men suspected Moshe of, of some sort of infidelity with the wives. So where is that? How, how, how do we understand that? What do we do with this? So when 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 you read a statement like this, which is so you know, so, you know, it's so absurd, so wild this accusation, it must mean, obviously, that there's some deep explanation to it. It must mean that this is a code word. These are codes to give us some deep understanding of who Moshe was and what his relationship to Christ well, was all about. And that's what we want to explore right now. It can't, <clears throat> it can't be taken on face value. It's, 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 it's too huge. It's too wild. Every man accuses Moshe of infidelity. Every man, how could that be? I mean, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So what I'd like to look at right now are really two things. We'll look together at a, a Malbim and a Maram. <clears throat> Both deal with this question in slightly different ways. But what they do demonstrate to us is, number one, when our sages say things which are very difficult to understand, how we have to penetrate and we have to understand and analyze it in order to get the depth of what they're saying. And the depth of what they're saying is, is, is very, very powerful and very meaningful. So let's see if we can understand this statement. But if you just read it, we'd certainly be very, very bothered by it, you know, by this type of accusation. True? Is that a good point? Should be almost like shocked. 
what? Moshe Rabbeinu accused of infidelity with every woman of the Jewish nation? Like that wasn't, I didn't learn that in Hebrew school, you know? They didn't teach me that. That's not in, uh, right? That's not, I, I never heard that before. Let's understand what it means. And uh, our, our main, our main uh, target's gonna be the Marami Prague. But first let's take a look at, at a, uh, a Kli Yoker. Also one of the great Mepharshim on Torah was the Kli Yoker. <clears throat> the Kli Yoker says like this. He says, He says something like this is too distant from the human mind to comprehend. It says, He says, I don't, I don't, goes, I don't really have an explanation. Ain't no remez papasa. He said, where do you get this from? His question is, I don't see this anywhere. So be bothered by this. This is something people are, are bothered by. There's no hint to this anywhere. So therefore, when there's no hint to it, it's obviously must be coming from a place which is, uh, is much higher. Is there, is there a question? Somebody had a question? <clears throat> okay. Now, what does the mob say this? Um, well, actually, go right to the morals. We'll go to the moral. The moral, who was the moral of Prague? The moral of Prague was Rabbi Huda Lowy, Huda Leib Lowy, and he lived in basically in Prague, years 1520, 1609. So, yeah, I'm sorry. The Marabi Prague was probably the greatest sages, really, of the whole 16th century. In 1520 to 1609, he covered the 1500s. And he wrote a huge amount of, of philosophical writings. And you can actually visit his, his cover today in, in Prague. Yeah, I'm going to explain the accusation. So, it, it, and then we'll do it through the Maharal in Prague. So, again, the Maharal, we call him the Maharal. We call him the Rabbi Huda Levi, Huda Levi, Levi Lowy. You could visit his grave and the shul where he was the Rav in Prague today. I've been there a number of times with different emmet groups. A very beautiful place to go and to see, especially his keber. And he wrote different works. And in about five places, he addresses this question. So I'm, I'm just going to take us to, to, to two of them right now. So first of all, he says, the Malami Prague says, one way to understand this. It's not very interesting. Because what does it mean? That the dog Kigama Moshe Rabbeinu Amosh Chashdu or some Eishesish. How can they suspect Moshe Rabbeinu of of Eishesish? Eishesish means being involved with another man's wife. That that's too as the you know as the Kliyokra said that's too distant from the human mind to comprehend. So this is what he says. Yikhoshdu as Moshe Rabbeinu Eishesish. What could it mean? Kiyami Kiklai Yisroch Heni Yoch Nechalish Baruch Hu Nikul Ba Yisroch. So he wants to the first explanation. He wants to say just a very, it's a, it's a metaphor. The Kla Yisrael are designated to a Kodesh Baruch to Hashem. For who Nikwa Baal Yisrael? Hashem, so to speak, is the husband of Kla Yisrael. In other words, in our relationship, the Jewish nation's relationship with, with, with the Kodesh Baruch or with Hashem, it's a relationship of like a husband and wife. And Hashem, so to speak, is the husband. And in this context, we receive from Hashem. And therefore, the, the nature of the Jewish nation has more the feminine aspect and more and more like a wife in this, in this respect. So he says, Dahaino, that's what he means. Dahaino, El Haklav Em Yucha Liot Novi Oklaiso. Rak Hashem is Bar Hu Oklaiso. Hashem really, you know, is sort of the. We all belong to Hashem, as it were. And that's why it says, And therefore, the, the, the followers of Korach accused Moshe, and he said, He said, You're not the only one who heard the words from Hashem. You're not the only one who heard it was at Har Sinai. That's to say, What does that mean? He's saying, in other words, he said like this. 
what 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 does what does infidelity mean? What, what's the aspect of of of, of um, interfering with someone else's marriage? If there is a special relationship between husband and wife, and someone else walks in there and disrupts that, and so and so to speak says, you know, I, I'm I'm going to take the place of the husband. That's called infidelity, immorality. If Hashem, so to speak, is the husband of Klai Yisrael, and all of a sudden Moshe steps in, and Moshe says, I'm the communicator. I'm going to be the one who's going to bring down the word of God to you. You have to go through me, so to speak, to get to Hashem. Of course, everyone has direct relationship with Hashem. We're not talking in any way this Christian model in any means. You know, and everyone has direct communication. But Moshe is that primary teacher. As we know that at Har Sinai, the first thing Hashem, you know, what does Hashem say at Har Sinai? Hashem says in front of Klai Yisrael, you know, Moshe is to be your teacher. Moshe is the one I'm speaking through. So listen to Moshe. He is direct. He is the direct communicator of me. Of course, Coach Baruch Hu does that in front of the entire Jewish nation. So the Jewish nation should, should understand that Moshe isn't just making it up. He's getting it from Hashem. He's not usurping power. But still, the fact that Moshe, so to speak, is sort of this liaison between the message of Hashem and the Jewish nation, if our relationship with Hashem is such, like a marriage, so what's this middle party doing there? That's like a sense of, of immorality. That's a sense like a, a man kind of interfering in a marriage. So the first explanation of Maral is he says, this is, what, this is part of their accusation. When Korach came and said, you're seizing too much power. You know, we're all holy. So what does that mean? He says like this. He says, We all heard God say, I'm the Lord your God, from, from, from Hashem's mouth. That's to say, So what are you coming in and saying? You're the Navi. You're the prophet for the Jewish nation. What are you doing interfering with our relationship with Hashem? This is like, a, this is like you're like, a, you're like an usurper. Like another man coming into the marriage. If you want to take away, it's like a man coming to the marriage. Why do you take away someone else's wife? We're the wife according to, to, to Hashem, as it were. And you're coming in, so to speak. And you want to take us away from the husband. That's the definition of infidelity. Look, do we hear that, everybody? Look at in other words, the first explanation of Maral is the accusation again wasn't literal. You weren't accusing Moshe, but God forbid of. Of, of, of being intimate with all the women of clients from. It's like our relationship with Hashem is such that we all have a direct relationship with God. He's the husband for us. He's our Baal. And Moshe Rabbeinu, you're coming in and saying, you're the Navi for everybody. You're the prophet for everyone. You're that, that liaison. You're that link. What are you doing interfering with our relationship? Just like a man walks into the relationship between a husband and a wife and interferes with it. That's infidelity. You're interfering where you don't belong. That was their accusation. Now, that fits very nicely because that's really what they were accusing Moshe of. We all stood at Harsinai. We all were there. We're all Kedosh, and we all heard Hashem say, Anochi Hashem Lochecho, I'm Lord your God. Moshe, why are you coming in now? And, you know, we're coming in and interfering with that relationship. Now, again, that accusation was based on jealousy because they all did witness God say that Moshe is to be the intermediary. But when jealousy gets in and wants to look for a reason, like in Korach's case, why he wants the power, we could hear this is a good argument to foment against Moshe. You know, you are exactly like in usurper in a marriage. You're guilty of infidelity. You're interfering with our relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu, and we all have a right and to that relationship, he's our, all of our husbands. What are you doing saying you have the, the teachings come through you, that you make these decisions? You're interfering. That's what intermarriage is. That's what, in, that's what infidelity is, isn't it? Oh, beautiful explanation. Do you hear that explanation number one? Now, by the way, Yermi Navi, the Maral points out, was also accused of this. Yirmiyahu was the prophet who prophesied really the time of destruction of the first temple. And 
Klai Yisrael accused him of the same language. Or the says, V'chein Yermio. So to Yermio and Navi, the prophet Yermio, he was the Navi of Klai Yisrael. He was the prophet for the entire Klai Yisrael, the entire Jewish nation. And Amro Shezehu Eish And he said about him also, you are violating a marriage. Because Christ from the Jewish nation is married to God, and therefore you, the prophet, are interfering with our relationship with God. Of course, the reason he accused Jeremiah of this was because he was telling them things that they didn't, they didn't want to hear. That unless they do tshuva, Hashem is going to do is going to destroy the town. He's going to take away our, our base of Middash. So the the kind of you know the psychology of the the, of the nation was. It must mean that you're just interfering with our relationship with God. The Chach Moshe Alevashon, so to by Moshe Rabbeinu, they suspected him of Eish Eish. They suspected him of interfering in a marriage. Interesting, just like Yirmiyahu and them. Okay, that's the first explanation I wanted to share. First explanation is, of the idea is that, God forbid, did Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, commit any act of infidelity? That's impossible. That's not what's going on. But the relationship with the Jewish nation is a marriage. God's relationship with the Jewish nation is a marriage. And therefore, Moshe, what are you doing being the, the, the prophet for the Jewish people? What, what are you doing stepping in, into the middle there, so to speak? Now, again, their accusation is really based on, on Korach's jealousy of Moshe. Because had that jealousy not been in there, they would have realized, wait a minute, did it, God spoke to the direct Jewish nation and in front of the Jewish nation, it's not Moshe is to be the prophet. It's not like Moshe was making this up. They all heard God say Moshe is to be a prophet. But Korach is utilizing Moshe's position now against Moshe. Why are you interfering with that relationship with the Kosh And there's some truth in that, right? The truth is, we do all have a relationship with Hashem. The Jewish nation is married to God. We all have that intimate relationship with Hashem. Therefore, what is the job of the prophet? You know, in the Hasidic circles, it's the Rebbe. The Rebbe has a has a has a you know understands the neshama of a of 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 a, of, a, of a Hasid, and therefore the Rebbe helps the Hasid to develop his neshama. That's the job of a prophet. That's the job of Moshe Rabbeinu. So the, it was a miss, you know, a, a turning Moshe Rabbeinu's actual function against him, as it were, and utilizing the strong language of, of, you are interfering with a marriage. You're guilty of violating a marriage. A very strong accusation. So I hear just a few points I think come out of this. Number one, we got to appreciate we're married to Rosh Baruch Hu. I think it's a very beautiful point. Number two, you know, it's interesting. Our sages express this in very metaphorical language sometimes. And, and, and that language needs to be penetrated and understood. And to say we're going to understand it just on face value, of course we'll get a, a, a distorted definition and understanding. And how interesting it is that our sages, you know, sages, I mean the sages of the Talmud going back approximately 1700, 1800 years ago, these are all based on Midrashim, which go back even further, which are connected to Kleisvold's history, you know, either during the Midbar or in the desert or, or afterwards, it, it's this, this insight of, of the great sages of the Jewish nation and the way they weren't afraid to say things in ways that could be very uh, inflammatory, you know, very, very scary to hear. And, and an ear that misunderstands it come up with the wrong, wrong conception. But the confidence in the, the confidence in the system, the confidence in knowing we have truth and emiss Never, there's no fear to say things which are which were, are truthful, even if one's expressing it in a metaphoric way. Okay, are we okay with this point, everybody? Please jump in if you have any any any. If you'd like to share something, have any questions? We're okay with that. That's approach number one. Jewish nation is married to a shem. Approach number two, and this comes from another point, place in the Mara. And this is the one that, that, that intrigues me the most. Because he takes us back to a story in the beginning of Bracious. And what's that story? 
It says that when, before Chava was created, before he was created, it says that Adam was sent out to name the animal kingdom. And what does it mean to name them? He, well, he gave them all very, she, he named the names that, the names that we have for the animals all comes from Adam. Hashem wanted him to be a partner, so to speak, in naming the animal kingdom. So how did he do it? He went out and he, he looked at the animals and he knew their essence and he gave them names based on that essence. So, for example, I always like to use this as my example. He it's, it's, looked at the elephant and he said, you're a peel. In Hebrew, an elephant is a peyud lamed, a peel, peel. And why, why is a peyud lamed the perfect description of an elephant? Because the letter pe means a mouth. Pe. The letter yud, yad, means a hand. The letter lamed means lamed, teach. Lamed, teach. Mouth, hand, teach. Peel. Oh. Let's put that one together. Well, where does the elephant have his hand? On his mouth. That's called the trunk. He's a hand on mouth. And what does that teach? Well, that trunk is so powerful, it could lift up a tree. And it's so delicate, you could dissect a seed from a nut. It's both a tractor and a laparoscopic operating tool in the same organ. That's pretty amazing. We human beings can only, we can create tractors, you know, and, but that can move a lot of dirt. And we can create very refined and, and intricate operating tools. But we haven't been able to create a tractor that's both a tractor and an operating tool. If the elephant has that strength of the tractor and that delicacy of the operating tool on that hand on its mouth. So Adam looked at him and he said, you're a peel. The hand on its mouth teaches. What does it teach? The glory of God. Only the creator can create something like that. That's the other thing. So he called them a peel, a peyed lamb. Okay? So he went to all the animals, and he named them all. Now, our sages say something over there that is a little bit shocking. It says, It says that, before Eve was created, he went out the animal kingdom. But our sages say that it, what does it mean he went to the animal kingdom? It teaches us that that he had some sort of marriage with all the animals. It's a language of marriage. A language of marriage. He married the animals. But he was not at peace until finally Kodesh Baruch Hu created Eve for him. So how do we understand that? Now, again, listen to what I'm going to say. It does not mean bestiality. It cannot mean that. How do we know it cannot mean that? Because when it says that the Gemara in heaven says that one of the commandments when he was commanded not to eat the tree, it says the Yitzav, and he commanded other eights that included the seven laws of Noah. And the seven laws of Noah, one is absolutely that any type of bestiality is forbidden. This is not possible. Impossibility. But our sages use a language of marriage. Let me repeat that. I'm going to repeat it. Why? Because I gave a share on this about, um, I don't know how many years ago, over 10 years ago, which went up online and it went on YouTube. And I got a lot of views, like over 100,000 views. And all of a sudden people started, all of a sudden someone started claiming, Rabbi Kraft said that Adam had bestiality with, uh, with the animals. So it's exactly what I didn't say. You know, there's a metaphor going on over here. And I said it over and over again. Please do not misinterpret my words because I want to teach you something. But people misinterpret my words. So I want to stress to our group right now, please listen very carefully what I'm saying. It does not mean bestiality. God forbid. God forbid. That's forbidden from the divine system. 
and the one and the first commandment given to Adam called the Yitzav, and he commanded him on the tree. Included that was the seven laws given to Noah, which are morality. Okay, but I say that because uh, you know someone misinterpreted my words, and I, I was very disturbed by that. I think they misinterpreted. So whenever I, I say this concept, I emphasize over and over and over again that is a metaphor. There's a deeper concept going on, but we're going to try to understand that deeper concept. So it says like this. Our sages used this language that he had like a marriage with the animals, not just naming the animals, but he had a marriage. So what could that possibly mean? So this is what the Ma'al says. And this is going to be a very similar concept to what we're going to understand about the accusation about motion. So he says like this. He says, The explanation is, God forbid would you possibly think that there was any bestiality. It's both morally and, and, and ethically absolutely forbidden, and it's uh, you know, and biologically impossible. So it's not. it's obviously some sort of metaphor. It says, the fact, it says, in the, when he commanded him on the tree, he commanded him on all sexual morality. So what's the explanation? This is a very deep idea. That our relationship, the relationship of the human being with the animal kingdom is such that the job of mankind is to give completion to the animal kingdom. The animal kingdom, so to speak, the physical world needs man. In other words, we're here, the world is here, so to speak, in order to help fulfill the mission of humanity. That's why Kodesh Baruch creates a world. He doesn't need to create a world of birds and, 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 and bees and things like this. He creates it only because it's part of helping humanity fulfill its purpose. It's all there for us. So we have a relationship with the animal kingdom, with the world. We do, and, and you know, with the real relationship. What does that relation look like? It means we give it meaning. If there, weren't, if there wasn't a human being in the world, there would be no meaning for the animal kingdom. We complete the animal kingdom, so to speak. The, the animal kingdom is looking to the human, the human world in order to... to to sort to spiritually allow for its existence. Because remember, the whole purpose of creation is that we should utilize our free choice, our relationship with the Kosh Baruch forever. So what do we need the animal kingdom for? Why did Hashem create it? So it's there to help serve us. It's, it's there to help to enable our, you know, to, to give the world existence, to give us pleasure also in observing it and seeing it and to learn from it. You know, the Lord says you can learn things from the animal kingdom. You can learn, you can learn a work ethic from an ant. Never stops working till the day it dies. Never stops moving. It says, "Well, can learn modesty from a cat, because a cat, we you know, is very private in the way it does its private functions." The animal kingdom is there to teach us. At the same time, it teaches us, and it's looking for us to, so to speak, to give it existence. Because without us, there's no purpose for it. So when it says he came upon all the animals in marriage, so to speak, it says he recognizes his job vis-a-vis -vis the animal kingdom was to give it existence, to give it purpose and meaning. It's there for us. It's there to serve us. And at the same time, we give it meaning by, by allowing it to serve us. So to speak. That's marriage, by the way. That's the aspect of marriage. Where there, one part where the husband comes into marriage, so to speak, and is to some extent completing its other half. Our wife is completing her other half. Is that we're still completing the animal kingdom because his existence depends on us. That we're, we're, we're entering that, that's some level of a marriage, giving it an existence. Right? That we perhaps we might want to even say this, you know. Sometimes, you know, the, the when that chicken ends up on your Shabbat table, right? It's it's you don't have to feel bad for the chicken. It said that chicken is fulfilling its purpose of creation to allow it to, to elevate the Shabbat. You know, it's it's elevating the Shabbat to its existence. So we, we, we don't necessarily have to feel bad for it. We could choose to not eat if we don't want to, but we might not have to. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, no. Can, can anybody hear me? Do we have uh, hands up? I hear you. 
Yes, me? everything is okay. Okay, yeah, someone just suggested it. You can hear me. Okay, uh, Rosa, maybe it's your phone? I don't know. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to speak louder. So do we hear that point, everybody? Are we with me on that? That, that, that Adam's relationship to the animal kingdom was like a marriage, completing it. And that's why our rabbis used that language to say it was like a, a, an intimacy. It wasn't a physical intimacy. It was what marriage is supposed to be, where one gives completion to the other, gives meaning to the other. That, that through that, that relationship, there, there is a greater wholeness, a greater meaning than was there before. The animal kingdom is looking to the human kingdom, so to speak, to say, give me meaning. There's no existence without, without us. The whole purpose of the world is for us, that we should have free choice to get a relationship with Kodesh Baruch for forever. So what do we need the animals for? So our relationship with the animals is like a marriage. We're giving meaning, completing them. So our rabbis express that in the language of an intimacy. That's, that's the intimacy of marriage, to, to, to have this unity where you're giving completion to the other. It, God forbid, doesn't mean a physical intimacy. It's just what, what the intimacy is all about, where we're giving a greater sense of, of, of shlemut, of completion. That's, that's what our rabbis are trying to express through that. So it, it's, but again, they're not afraid to use a language of marriage. So, but God forbid doesn't mean, like the Ma'al says, chas v'chalila, which doesn't mean, doesn't mean intimacy in, in, the, in the physical sense. That, that was, that's forbidden from the Torah, as we know. So it is interesting. You can say things very directly, but people get the wrong idea. You know, so I was very concerned when people said, they misunderstood what I meant. You know, it would bother me a lot. I remember where I, you know, so, but, you know, sometimes you have to, so whenever I say these concepts, I, I repeat it over and over again, <laughs> that we're, we're, we're getting a deep, insight into, into what marriage is right now. That the aspect of, of intimacy is this aspect of parties completing each other. There's a spiritual completion happening. There's a physical expression of it, and there's a spiritual expression. The spiritual expression is that one is able to give over to another in a way where the essence of that other becomes even more full. And again, Adam's relationship with the animal kingdom was such. That, that the animal kingdom had, was able to have a purpose because of Adam's existence. And that's what he went out and named it. You know, I'm, I'm to some extent, your husband, I'm giving you a, a purpose, a meaning, a completion. Okay, are we, are we good on that, everybody? We hear that point? Any questions on that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, yes, thank you. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, okay. Now, let's see where the moral takes us. Listen to where he goes with this. And this gets it's very beautiful. He says like this. He says that that Rak Pirusha Minesha Adamut Suras Kohamin Bohu Noslim Shlemos. That it means that Adam he gave a sura, a form to all the creation, and gave them their completion. It says, "V'kot suru mischander la'asher who wrote suru," and "kot suru" is joined to that which "sher who wrote suru," which needs a form. What does that mean? The morale uses the language here, and this is a language I think I've, I've mentioned before. It's the language of we calls on the Hebrew words "suru v'chomer." Chomer means like the word, uh, it means chomer in Hebrew means like a material, like mud, raw material. Surah means form. He said there are two ways the world works. It's chomer and surah. You know, for example, you have a tree. A tree has a potentiality. That's called the chomer. The purpose of that tree, let's say it's a peach tree. The purpose of that tree is peaches. That's called the surah. The Chomer is what it exists in form. The Tzura, what is its purpose that comes out of it? That's what he always calls the Tzura and the Chomer. Chomer, raw material, potentiality. Tzura is giving form and, and definition, giving, bringing out the essence of what that is supposed to be. That's the language that the Maharal uses throughout. So again, in the, the aspect of Adam and the animals, the animals have a potentiality. The tsura, the form, is when they're there to 
contribute to the to the destiny of the Jewish nation of of, of, of humanity, not just the Jewish nation of humanity. You know, when 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 the bee makes honey in order to allow the human being to put on his apple on on Rosh Hashanah, it's contributing. Or just the fact that uh, you know the animal keeping the whole ecosystem alive, which has prepares, which has a function in the ecosystem. You move, you, know, you move one spider out of the ecosystem, everything begins to to crumble. Interconnection in the ecosystem is is so intricate that and and that and, and it's all there for us, so that we should have a world that works. You know, I, I just just parenthetically, I, I became last. I go to Cape Cod a lot during the summer. My parents have a place in Cape Cod. And they've had a lot of sharks the last number of years. It's, it's an infestation with sharks. And the point where it's, it's, I never knew that growing up, that it's dangerous to go to the beach because of sharks. So I was speaking to with my kids. We went to like where the, these fishermen were there. And I was saying, like, what, you know, what do you think of all these sharks? And you know what he said? He said, I wish there were more of them. I said, really? What do you mean? Why? He said, because in the 1970s, a movie came out called Jaws. Did anybody see Jaws? You can admit it. You saw, did anybody see Jaws? <laughs> it was the blockbuster of the 1970s about a big shark. You see it? No one saw Jaws? Yes, you saw it. Good. Thank you. I saw it too. So I, and everyone was scared to go to the ocean to swim because it was so scary, this giant shark. But it created a wave of panic in the world. And it, it, people went out killing sharks. So the next, basically, decade, millions of sharks were killed throughout the oceans. And what did that do in terms of Cape Cod? Cape Cod has a lot of seals. And seals are, are naturally, you know, are, the sharks feed on seals. So as long as there are sharks, the seal population is kept, in, you know, in, intact. In other words, the sharks eat the seals. The seal population doesn't get too large. What happened was, was because all the sharks were killed, in the Atlantic or off of Massachusetts, the seal population, the seal herd in Cape Cod grew to a point of like something like about half a million, something like that, which is double what it's supposed to be, a huge seal population. Now that's dangerous. Why? Because first of all, their waste, um, you know, infects the, the beach line and destroys a lot of the, the, the algae and the plant life. And not only that, that they, they consume over, I think, a million pounds of fish a day. So it's killing the fishing industry. And, as, and, and the reason there's so many, since there's so many more seals kind of populating the beaches and, and the waters, so the sharks that are out there look, look at them and say, wow, this is you know, easy prey. You know, it's too easy. So they start moving closer inland in order to uh, just to get lunch. And of course, when human beings are out there, they mistake the human being further to the seal and, and there's some danger. So the fisherman said, I wish there were more sharks. The more sharks, they eat more seals. So the more seals, the seals would eat as many fish. My business would be better. So one movie, Jaws, and, and destroying the shark population so disrupts the ecosystem that, 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 you know, human being suffers. Fishermen suffer. All because of that movie, Jaws. Interesting, isn't that interesting? So it, 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 this, this idea that the human being is like gives a gives a definition to the animal kingdom, is the idea of giving that raw material a form. So listen to what he says now. He says that he says we call tsur who b'schab le shavu tsur. Okay, zesh amar shabal kol behem b'chayim. That's what it means that Adam came upon all the animals. Shor yadua ki atsur nimshal beish. Because it's known that the tsura is nimshal beish. A man job is in vis a marriage is to give tsura, is to give form. As it says, mikabo tsura nimshal minakeba. The one who receives that form is always known as the feminine aspect. So in in marriage, husband and wife, interesting idea. A woman in Hebrew is called a nikeva. A nikeva means, in Hebrew, literally means nikeva, means a cavity or an opening. What does that mean, an opening? Well, I guess we could say biologically that that's true in the differences between men, men and women. And there's a spiritual aspect that manifests. Physicality always is a manifestation of the spiritual core. The spiritual aspect of that 
is a woman in marriage, a wife, is capable of receiving from a husband, both receiving biologically in order to create new life, but also to receive spiritually in order to, to develop herself even further. That's called say, being a woman's name in the Hebrew language. I am open. The cave means open. I am open. Meaning I'm available to receive. I'm available for a spiritual message that will enact and bring out my true essence. And a man's job vis-a-vis -vis his wife is to be available to provide that, to, to give her that inspiration and spirituality that she needs in order to, to, to activate her, her coma, as it were, and develop the, the, the completeness of who she is. Just like biologically, it's true. And gives over to, 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 to enable a, a new, new tzura, a new form. And that's an expression of the spiritual essence, which you know, is, is a man is supposed to be giving over the idea of giving over sparks of, of, of spirituality, sparks of, of inspiration, sparks of, you know, sparks of, 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 of a meaning that allows his wife's life to, to be even greater and more fuller. That's the male aspect, giving it over. The woman's aspect is able to receive. By the way, which requires more strength? To give over or to be vulnerable and say, I'm willing to receive? It takes more strength to be willing to receive, by the way. It takes more humility. It's easier to give over. To say, I'm willing to, to give up my ego and receive is a female quality. And that takes a lot more guts, a lot more strength. And oftentimes, men who don't know that their job is to be there to give over to their wives and aren't doing it, they could leave, they, you know, could, could leave the woman, could leave her, husband, her wife very much empty and, and not fulfilled. In, in that aspect, to give more of the spiritual sparks of, 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 of development, as it were. So, you know, it's, it's an interesting concept. The male idea is to fill, to give the tzura the form. A female vision is to, to receive and say, I'm available to receive. And by the way, you know, when, when, when a woman says, I'm available to receive, it's really an act of giving. So I'm giving you the opportunity to express who you are. That's, an act, that's not passivity. That's by active. That's an active statement. So I'm willing and open to let you give over. I want to accept it. That also is active. And that's a male-female dynamic that exists in the world. Do we hear that a little bit? It's an important concept to understand. And, and you know, it's um, sometimes in marriages, they get confused. A man doesn't realize that, yeah, his job is to be giving over and to being that inspiration. And sometimes a wife might understand that her job is to allow her husband to be able to do that and be available for that and help him do it, succeed in that, and actively be receptive. And, and that creates a very dynamic and happy home. You know, but it could be when a wife isn't receptive to that, it doesn't, and stifles that, it doesn't allow it. You know, that, that could, man feels very, very, uh, could, could feel a little bit, um, uneasy. And a wife who's not receiving what she's supposed to receive from her husband also feels very dissatisfied. But, but this is a male-female spiritual dynamic. And in our relationship with Hashem, it's like that also. Hashem is giving over, and we're receiving. We have that female aspect vis-a-vis -vis Hashem. Is that clear a little bit? You know, it, it's, it's um, that's what's called Surah and Homer. So let's see if we can understand this in, in terms of what's happening over here. So it says like this, that it says, it says like this. In the relationship of Moshe Rabbeinu, the Jewish nation, Well, it says like this, you know, just like in the relationship, the male says, you know, just like Adam's relationship to the animal kingdom, so to speak, is called a marriage because he's completing the kingdom. It says, so to Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu's relationship with the Jewish nation was such where he's supposed to, so to speak, complete the Jewish people. In other words, what the Kodesh Baruch wants for Moshe Rabbeinu to be almost, in essence, is to give greater definition, greater form to each neshama of the Jewish people. Now again, 
one way to look at that is they said, Moshe, you're, you're cute. We're, we're, this is it. You know, this is infidelity. We're, we have a relation with the coach, with Hashem. What are you doing to fear? Another way to look at it is, is saying that if the job of Moshe is to complete every member of the Jewish nation, it means that he really has to understand each nation. He has to understand each person. He has to really be there to, 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 to really get who the other person is. Now, how can that be perceived, perhaps? It's the job of a husband, so to speak, to be able to understand his wife and to offer that fulfillment and that completion. And now there's Moshe Rabbeinu, someone, this great prophet, who seems to understand every person, or let's say every wife, better than the husband understands her. Wait a minute, it's a husband's job to give that surah, that form to the chomer, that form to the person. And now Moshe Rabbeinu is doing it. Moshe, that's infidelity. That's intermarriage. That's, that's, that's interfering with the intimacy of marriage. What are you doing? It was a misunderstanding of Moshe Rabbeinu, of the attack against Moshe Rabbeinu. You're interfering where you don't belong. See, had they understood Moshe Rabbeinu properly, had they gotten him and realized, wait a minute, he's not interfering. He's going to help every member of the Jewish nation bring out from themselves their completeness. He's not trying to interfere physically, God forbid. He's not trying to interfere emotionally. He's trying to tap and touch and help every neshama express itself and give it its surah, give it its form. But it's the job of a husband to do that. And therefore they turned to Moshe and said, you're interfering where you don't belong. That's, that's infidelity. And they accused Moshe of being infidel. So do we hear this a little bit? This is kind of the concept I wanted just to bring out for you this morning. Is, is this idea, maybe we'll stop over here with this. It's, it's, um, it's getting late. This is the concept I wanted to bring out to you. Was you know, the statement of our sages, which on one hand looked so um, explosive and so inflammatory. Moshe Rabbeinu is accused of, of having a relationship with every woman in Klai Yisrael. How could it? Again, that we analyze the Maharal, and we, we study it, we realize it's really an expression of a very deep spiritual concept. Either that every Jewish person has a relationship with Hashem, that for Moshe, why are you this intermediary? Of course, the, we need Moshe as that intermediary as a work, because God said he should be the communicator. But he is, so to speak, somewhere kind of getting in the way of the relationship with Hashem. Or the second def- explanation of Maral, which I think personally is, is, is very, very foundational that really a relationship of husband and wife is this idea of surah and chomer, where a man is supposed to give all the spark of inspiration, and a woman allows herself to receive. So if Moshe now is going to, so to speak, and say, I know how to create your, I know how to create you spiritually better than your husband does. Oh, you could hear how maybe a husband could be jealous of that. There could be a jealousy in that. How come he knows you better than me? Is that infidelity? Someone interfering in the marriage where they don't belong? But again, this accusation against Moshe is, is, is being misused because his ability to see who the Jewish people is and what they're all about is a function of the fact that he's going to help the Jew. He's going to help each person grow. He's not interfering. He's going to help the husband activate, the man activate his surah, bring out who he's supposed to be. He's going to be able to help the husband, help his wife, to bring out who she's supposed to be. He's going to contribute. He's not interfering. But in the jealousy of Korak and his followers, where they want to sort of discredit Moshe, they build it around an accusation. Moshe, you're interfering where you don't belong. That's an expression of infidelity. Okay, everybody. I think I'm going to stop at this point over here. Do we hear this? Any questions on this? Are there any questions on it? No questions. You know, what, what, what moves me the most about it is I think it really gives us a male-female paradigm, understanding marriage better. That marriage is about a man's job to be giving over and a woman's ability to be able to be in the keva to receive. And by saying, I want to receive what you have to give over and have the humility to remove my ego to say, I'm ready to, to, to grow with you and from you. That takes a tremendous amount of strength. That's an active reception. 
that's actively saying, I'm open to your ideas. And a man to know that his job is to give over these ideas and to help his wife perfect herself and therefore to help him perfect himself in the process. That's really what creates the harmony of relationship in marriage. And that's Adam's relation to the animal kingdom. That's a husband's relation to his wife. That was most relation, most of relation to the Jewish nation. And again, our sages express it as an intimacy. That's what intimacy is all about. Helping the other develop something from inside themselves that they didn't have before. And the way our sages say it, or the way Moshe Rabbeinu is accused by Korach is, you're guilty of Asia's ish. You are mixing in where you don't belong. But again, that is a total distortion of, of what, what Moshe's function was. And what could have achieved had the allowed Moshe to say, I'm here for everybody. So this is a little bit of a vision of, of, of maleness and femaleness and, and how it's applied in the discussion of Moshe Rabbeinu and, and the Jewish nation. But in a practical way, well, first of all, practically understand just the statement of our sages are very deep. I want us to get that. You know, and they say things in ways you have to penetrate it to get its depth. And when you do, you hear a beauty in it. And number two, I think I just want us to start thinking about this in terms of maleness and femaleness, because this is because of a very important foundational model of all Jewish thought, of a man's job and a woman's job. A man is the idea of a mashbia, he gives over an idea. A woman is in the cave where she's open, she receives an active reception where she removes her ego and says, I want to grow from you. I want you to be the surah for my home. I want you to give form to me. And a man, by being able to allow himself to be able to give form to somebody else, develops his own self. And that's the harmony where, where, where male-female relationships can exist and we live. Okay, buddy, maybe we'll hold it here. And uh, I wish you a wonderful day. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, text me or email me, whatever you like, or call me. And, um, and enjoy the rest of the day. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye, big off from your shine. Thank you. Bye, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Rabbi. You're welcome.